Welcome, Age of Vintage Society. It's not clear what made actor Ryan O'Neill more famous, his role in the 1970s tearjerker love story or his reputation for being a difficult character. This blue-eyed charmer's acting career didn't take off like he wanted it to, so the ex-boxer took his aggressions out on, well, pretty much anyone foolish enough to be within arm's length, especially his family. Is Ryan O'Neill the worst father in Hollywood? Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you are new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Age of Vintage channel. In actor Ryan O'Neill's world, events don't unfold in mundane fashion. There is usually drama, the kind that sustains reality shows and draws gossips and tabloid journalists like ants to a picnic, the kind that makes for a hell of a story. Charles Patrick Ryan O'Neill, more popularly known as Ryan O'Neill, is a well-known American actor. He was an amateur boxer before he shot to limelight with his acting ventures. O'Neill's early foray into acting was as Rodney Harrington on Peyton Place, a soap opera aired on ABC. Soon he started acting in films. He was lauded for his portrayal of Oliver in the adaptation of Eric Siegel's best-selling book Love Story. His filmography boasts other successful films like What's Up Doc, Paper Moon, Barry Lyndon, The Main Event, etc. The talented actor faced disappointments in his career when he was selected and later rejected for roles in The Godfather and Rocky. His personal life too remained peppered with sensational events like his extramarital affair with actress Farrah Fawcett. He supported Fawcett through her treatment of cancer and this was included in the documentary Farrah's Story, a two-hour footage of the actress's struggle with the fatal disease. Born Patrick Ryan O'Neill on April 20, 1941 in Los Angeles, California, he was born into show business as the son of writer Charles Blackie O'Neill and actress Patricia O'Callaghan. He may not have come out of the womb fighting, but he was at it from a very early age. His father built him a boxing ring when he was just seven years old. In his teens, O'Neill went on to train to become a Golden Gloves boxer at University High School in Los Angeles. As he set off into adulthood, this hot-tempered youth maintained his love for fighting, in and out of the boxing ring. O'Neill's blonde, clean-cut hair and innocent blue eyes were a perfect disguise for his fiery disposition. When O'Neill was 18, he got into an argument with a stranger at a party. Instead of using his words, O'Neill did something much worse. He went on the attack. But this was no ordinary party fight. O'Neill spent 51 days in prison for it but this incident barely scraped the surface. Determined to make his own way, O'Neill trained to become a professional boxer, competing in two Golden Gloves championships in 1956 and 1957. He had an impressive amateur fighting record, 18 wins to 4 losses with 13 knockouts. In the late 1950s, O'Neill and his family moved to Germany for his father's job writing broadcasts for Radio Free Europe. O'Neill continued his schooling at the Munich American High School until he landed his first job in the entertainment industry as a stuntman on the American television series Tales of the Vikings. In 1962 he appeared in a supporting role in the television show Empire. The show did not run long, but he got noticed by casting directors. He married the lovely actress Joanna Moore, but that wasn't all. He also landed a coveted role on America's first prime-time soap, Peyton Place. O'Neill became a star overnight, and he and his beautiful wife quickly became the talk of the town. Fans across America looked up to this perfect couple, but behind the scenes, life proved far from golden. O'Neill and Moore had two children, Tatum and Griffin. The kids grew up in Hollywood, the land of excess, and O'Neill and Moore spent more time drinking and doing drugs than they did with their own children, but their problems went beyond neglect. There was something much more sinister happening at the O'Neill household. Because of O'Neill and Moore's partying, the children were frequently forgotten. They often found themselves fading into the blurry background as the party raged on around them. But Tatum O'Neill paints an even darker picture of her home life. She claims that because her parents weren't around, friends of the family abused her. 
Sadly, this was just the beginning of the tragic childhood her father afforded her. For anyone who doesn't know, Tatum O'Neill is a Hollywood legend. O'Neill holds the title as the youngest actor ever to win an Academy Award. The child star wore an iconic black and white suit with a bow tie when she accepted the Oscar in 1974 for her supporting role in the film Paper Moon. O'Neill starred alongside her father Ryan O'Neill in the movie about a con artist team in the 1930s. Despite having no previous acting experience, Tatum commanded the screen with her performance and quickly won the hearts of critics and audiences. And yet, like many child stars, Tatum O'Neill's life was no Hollywood fairy tale. Known for speaking candidly about her struggles surrounding family discord, abuse, addiction and more throughout the past few decades, the actor has bravely shone a light on the darker side of Tinseltown. I've stood my ground in life, alone, even against overwhelming forces, with the might and money to crush me. I've purged myself of bitterness and anger and remained open to love. I've kept my moral compass intact and aimed at true north. She added, I have survived and won. Winning the Oscar for Paper Moon should have been a joyous event for ten-year-old Tatum O'Neill. Instead, the actor told that she felt overwhelming sadness and utterly abandoned in her moment of glory. O'Neill related that neither of her parents attended the awards ceremony. In fairness, Ryan O'Neill was filming a movie in England at the time, and while Tatum did receive a congratulatory phone call from her father, her mother, Joanna Moore, said nothing. I had little sense of accomplishment. There was no fanfare from anyone who mattered to me. Tatum has also claimed that her father's jealousy boiled over into a violent rage. Ryan reportedly punched his young daughter in the face after she received the nomination. In Paper Moon, O'Neill plays a con man who uses a fake daughter as a way to grift various people out of their hard-earned cash. Given O'Neill's disappointing track record as a father, this wasn't a stretch for him, but while his performance was more than convincing, it was young Tatum who stole every scene. In fact, the Academy nominated Tatum and not O'Neill. O'Neill and Moore's partying spun out of control. It didn't help that Moore tried to patch up her failing career with even more booze and drugs. Everything about their marriage fell into a downward spiral. There were also shocking allegations against O'Neill claiming he battered his wife. Life at the O'Neill residence became overwhelmingly toxic and Moore finally got the courage to pack up the kids and leave but after leaving their father, the children faced an even darker nightmare. When O'Neill and Moore split, it left Moore, struggling with addiction and now depression, alone with the kids. Tatum O'Neill has some harsh memories of having little food and using the floor as a bathroom. After the two divorced in 1967, Moore's drug and alcohol use spiralled into a full-blown addiction. But her worst memory of all? Her mother's teenage boyfriend beat her frequently. The neglect and abuse became so severe that Moore lost custody of her children in 1970. Tatum was only six years old. Moore continued to act through the mid-80s, but tragically never got sober and was arrested multiple times for alleged DUIs. She died from lung cancer in 1997 at the age of 63. And what about O'Neill? Where was he during all of this? After Joanna Moore lost custody, Tatum O'Neill and her brother Griffin O'Neill went to live with their father. Unfortunately, the actor has claimed that life with Ryan O'Neill wasn't much better. She was exposed to her father's sexual escapades and drug use as a young child. The Oscar winner went on to recount how the love story actor's alleged physical, emotional and verbal abuse affected her. She often asked herself, am I going to be loved today, adding, it's hard to grow up like that. For his part, Ryan has woven an ambiguous narrative in interviews. He has denied many of his daughter's claims, but also admitted that he was a hopeless father. While O'Neill's ex-wife and children were living a deplorable existence, O'Neill gleefully remarried in Hawaii. This time it was with his Peyton Place co-star Lee Taylor Young. O'Neill proved that he wasn't cut out for marriage. Ryan O'Neill, Bo Bridges and John Voight were all approached with the same role, but only O'Neill saw something that the others didn't. And boy, he was right. 1970's Love Story, which would later become the world's number one weep-fest, launched O'Neill's career into the stratosphere and even earned him a nomination for Best Actor. 
America was about to fall head over heels in love with Ryan O'Neill, but even though taking on the film was the right choice, he still made a significant mistake. O'Neill raked in only $25,000 for starring in Love Story. What made O'Neill angry was that his co-star, Ali McGraw, whose husband was the Paramount studio head, received a percentage of the film's profits, thus securing her fortune. O'Neill, lacking clout and foresight, never made a similar deal and lost out on a ton of money, but O'Neill soon found other, more lecherous ways to reap his just reward. Portraying a young, handsome man who loses his wife to cancer turned O'Neill into a babe magnet. The rumour was that O'Neill didn't have to flirt, he simply had to walk into a room to get any woman he wanted. That's how he reportedly robbed French actress Anouk Emet away from Albert Finney. O'Neill was a total womaniser, but it wasn't long before his fatherly duties interrupted his libertine agenda. His illicit habits paved the way for tragedy. The O'Neill household overflowed with all sorts of bad influences for children. O'Neill's drug habit meant that sketchy dealers frequently visited the home. On one occasion a dealer came upon Tatum unsupervised. That's when something terrible happened. The drug dealer molested Tatum. Devastated and distraught, she mustered up the courage to tell her father the terrible truth. When Tatum told her father about her horrific run-in with the dealer, O'Neill blamed his daughter, insisting that she must have led him on. And then O'Neill made matters worse, much worse. He kept the accused drug dealer on the payroll. In O'Neill's mind, daughters were a dime a dozen, but a good dealer was hard to find. O'Neill didn't learn much from his abysmal shortcomings. His son, Griffin O'Neill, maintains that when he was 11 years old, his father offered him drugs. O'Neill absolutely denies this, claiming he'd never share his expensive drugs with anyone, let alone Griffin. But whether the claim is true or not, O'Neill's track record speaks for itself. For O'Neill, his children were never a main concern, and unfortunately, they always paid the price. O'Neill's buddy, the six million dollar man's Lee Majors, had coupled up with Farrah Fawcett of Charlie's Angels and formed a formidable Hollywood twosome. O'Neill, following Majors' instructions, asked Fawcett out. Like an angel, Fawcett obediently told her husband about it, and he forbade her to go on the date. Maybe Majors realised the potential catastrophe O'Neill's reputation posed and changed his mind, but the damage was already done. O'Neill wanted Fawcett for himself and with his lusty determination, nothing could stop him, not even the six million dollar man. It wasn't long after this that Majors had asked O'Neill to take Fawcett to dinner, but it just didn't sit right with O'Neill. A week later he saw there was a Rai Kuda concert, knowing Fawcett was a fan gave him the excuse he needed to invite her to the show. I thought I'd hear from you, Fawcett answered the phone. O'Neill extended the invite, but Fawcett said she'd have to call him back with an answer. Eventually she agreed to go, but talked to Majors right before. I let him know that Ryan asked me out. He said, I told him to, but you're not going. Around this time, Majors started calling O'Neill's house and hanging up, finally one time saying, stay away from my woman. That tumultuous start foreshadowed much of how Fawcett, who separated from Majors in 1979 and divorced him in 1982, and O'Neill's eventual relationship turned out to be. While their love for one another was electric, it also came with high-powered drama that played out in the public sphere because of their names. There were times they were the idyllic couple, showering each other with love in front of the press, but then there was the drug abuse and family drama and that infamous 1997 infidelity incident when Fawcett walked in on O'Neill and the General's daughter, actress Leslie Ann Stephenson. That was the breaking point, or so it seemed. After two decades together, they split in 1998. But O'Neill thinks it may have been other things, including her menopause and his attitude. The break may have been what they needed, since it made each of them realise how essential the other was in their lives. And when O'Neill was diagnosed with leukaemia in 2001, they reunited. After all, they realised the truth. We pulled apart, but we never popped loose, he said. Fawcett took on the role of caretaker and O'Neill was soon in remission. As fate would have it, the tables turned. Fawcett was diagnosed with anal cancer in 2006 and O'Neill dedicated himself to take care of her. 
marriage was never something either of them needed. But when Fawcett's cancer came back with a vengeance, O'Neill made an important decision. Faced with losing her, he proposed, but sadly they never made it to the altar. Just before the priest arrived to officiate the wedding, Fawcett passed away. Instead of saying his vows, O'Neill listened to her last rites. He carried his grief with him until the day of her funeral. It was there that he came face to face with a beautiful stranger. At Fawcett's funeral, O'Neill said goodbye to his partner of three decades. At the ceremony, a blonde woman he didn't recognise gave him a hug of condolence. After getting a good look at the blonde funeral attendee, O'Neill realised he was staring at his very own daughter. It all clicked into place when she said, Daddy, it's me, Tatum. Having not seen Tatum for five years, O'Neill hadn't recognised her at all. Unsurprisingly, this awkward reunion reflected the sad state of their relationship. It was a bond beyond repair. O'Neill was spot on with this comment as his terrible parenting produced a legacy of heartbreak. If you liked this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you are new here, and if you want to support my work, please visit my Patreon page. Now it is your turn. What do you think about the life and legacy of Ryan O'Neill? If O'Neill's legacy is his children, then he has a lot of explaining to do. Tatum, Griffin and Redmond all bear the scars of poor parental guidance.